Hey everyone, it's Jim and Charles from Valves and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in Tube Lab number 191, well, we're getting closer to 200. Yeah, we're trying to figure out what to do for it. If you have any ideas, put them below. Yeah, well, I said we should go on vacation. <laughs> that wouldn't be nice. Uh, we're going to talk about OTL amps and the tubes they use. And I'll explain what OTL is in just a minute. It's pretty fascinating. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult the professional technician when in doubt. Okay, what in the heck is an OTL amp? And why are the tubes it uses so, well, weird? OTL stands for Output Transformer Less and simply means the amp output stage couples with the speakers or headphones without a transformer in between. Let's take a quick look at a couple of schematics to show you the difference. Now, oh, here it is. <laughs> so here is our um, GU50 kit monoblock and um, there's a lot on here, but really we just want to focus on this area over here. Yeah, thanks Charles. So th this is the GU50 tube, and here is our output transformer, and here's our speaker. So if you see the, the B+, plus, the high voltage, comes through the primary windings of the transformer, and it lands on the plate. And this, this, uh, um, this tube gets biased in a very conventional manner using a cathode bias resistor here that's bypassed. And the important thing though is that the speaker is coupled through a transformer. Now remember, transformers don't have direct wire connections across. What they do is they, they use magnetism to transfer the electricity across and we end up basically with a whole series of windings and the number of windings, the turns of the windings this will, and of course the gauge of the wire will all determine the voltages and how much current it can handle and it's all wound around an iron core though there's various types of transformers. Some will have gaps in the core. So the important thing to see here is that we've applied our high voltage here to this side of the windings. We have our magnetic coupling here and we have, so we have high voltage and low current on this side, a relatively low current. On this side we have relatively low voltage and um, low impedance. And high current. And high current. Yeah. Essentially what the transformer does is gives an impedance match. So it's taking a load over here and it's multiplying it by a certain amount on this side so that it looks like a much larger resistance for the tube. Mm -hmm. And of course transformers get their name from the fact that they transform. transform. <laughs> So anyways, this, the vast majority of amplifiers out there, whether it's an AV amp or a monoblock or a little boom box you've got, will function basically like this. Maybe not with a really awesome sounding GU50 output stage. Well, there's but, not too many of those out there. <laughs> yeah, in fact, the vast majority of amplification stages, of course, are solid state these days. That doesn't mean, of course, they sound very good. Um, the GU50 kit amp, by the way, is one of the best sounding Class A amps I've ever heard. It's just absolutely fantastic. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now to a much simpler schematic, as you can probably notice. <laughs> I was going to say, now that the, the, your, your um, inserted advertising is finished um, yeah. or over, uh, you can push your button to continue. <laughs> um, so what this is, Charles has just drawn up an, a very basic example of what an OTL 
output or power stage looks like and it's missing a lot of bits so you can't build this if you build this you'll blow up your speaker or worse maybe magic smoke maybe fire so don't build it folks but it it helps us understand what in fact an OTL amp is so and for expediency we've not shown the driver stage so let's just pretend our signal lands here and it's going to have enough voltage because we've got another big stage back here and we will so our AC signal comes in through the RCA and it lands on the grid I should say grids of the 6AS7 and 6082 now these are basically the same tube in fact Charles is going to show you um, a couple of examples of them in a few minutes later on yeah. but what it is is a twin triode and it's a very special twin triode and Charles will talk about that as well so it's essentially two big triodes inside one big glass envelope that's all we need to know for now so it's got two grids so they both get connected up we bring the high voltage the B plus to both plates and you might think huh wait a minute you're paralleling this tube Mm -hmm. and that's because we are and the reason we're doing that and you can see down here the cathode is paralleled as well and it's connected up to the positive of the speaker and the negative to the ground and let me repeat you can't build this circuit it's not complete don't try it <laughs> don't try it even if you think it's going to be fun it won't be um, you will kill your speaker or headphones so what happens when we parallel two tubes inside one envelope or we could have let's say we had another tube over here two single triodes or even two twin triodes it wouldn't matter what would happen happens when we parallel the impedance of the tube that's the electrical resistance of the whole tube think of the tube as an electronic circuit because mm -hmm. that's what it is it's got three electrodes well in this case it's got six because there's two tubes right but it's got a cathode, it's got a grid, and it's got a, a, a plate or an anode would be a more technical way of terming that. So parallel this tube with another tube and the impedance of the circuit goes in half. And the current it can push is doubled. And why is that important? Because the impedance of the device that we're driving the speakers is relatively low now this is example is using a headphone amp which has an advantage for OTL designs in the fact that a lot of headphones a lot of better headphones have higher impedance than your home speakers so a home speaker will have four or eight ohms maybe six ohms which is extremely low impedance and it makes it really tough to build an OTL amp to drive that low in impedance. Remember, you want to have lower impedance driving higher impedance or matching impedance. So 300 ohms is a fairly common value for headphones 150 is much more common 50 is even more common than yeah, that Yeah, and occasionally you'll see 600s as well but they're yeah. fairly rare i think but that gives you an idea so with otl headphone amp designs the load that the tube will be seeing is determined substantially by in this case the way we've drawn it by the impedance of the speaker or at the very least the ac load which is different from the dc load and it's that's a whole other complicated thing that yeah. we're not going to get into right yeah now. we've not included a whole bunch of stuff and we're actually i mean one of the reasons why we're doing this episode is because charles for a long 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 time has been dreaming of designing a kit that's an otl kit well, I've been working on it, playing with the idea, and maybe we'll come up with something. I think when you, I was there when you were born, and I think when you <laughs> popped out, I heard O-T-L. Hasn't been that long. <laughs> Hasn't been that long? It's been a long time. Anyways, um, we have a prototype build on my bench. Um, I don't know how I managed to grab the, the, the build. Were you busy designing something else? I think so. Probably. You didn't squeak, so... Um, yeah, you very kindly let me build it. And it's a lot of fun, let me tell you. They're very different builds. Anyways, um, so there, if it's successful, 
um, there will be uh, another prototype design to look at and listen to that will show you how this co works as a completed circuit. Yeah. Okay, so I think we got the basics down. What about the tubes, Charles? You've got a, a, a bunch to show us and talk a little bit about the various impedances. Yeah, so let's clear the deck and we'll be back with some tubes in just a second. Okay, so what have you got here, Charles, for us? All right, well, first let's talk a little bit about what makes a tube uh, a good candidate for an OTL setup. And the, the main thing you're looking for in that case is low plate resistance or low resistance in general. Like we were just talking about how if you parallel the sections, you get even lower resistance or impedance. And if you want a low impedance, generally you want a tube that is pushing current. You want a lot of current being pushed through. And generally they're gonna have fairly low amplification factor. But that also means that you want something that's a triode. As you add more electrodes between the plate and the cathode, you inc increase the resistance. So a good example of this is something like the KT88, which is a big current pushing tube. If you have it running as a, is it a tetrode or a pentode? Uh, as a tetrode. Yeah, so if you have it running as a tetrode, it actually has a plate resistance of 12K, which is fairly high, definitely not an OTL candidate. However, if you run it triode strapped, that drops all the way down to 670 ohms, which is getting in the range where it's usable for something like this. But with lots of really um, great candidates that are triodes, mm -hmm. there's no reason to start modifying KT88s. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So here's some great examples. And we're going to start from smallest to largest here. And over here, we've got one of our favorite dual triode tubes. This is the 6N6P. And excuse the burnt label on this. This one has seen a lot of hours in one of our test amps here. They get hot. They get hot. They are toasty little tubes because they are current pushers. But show them the design of the plates. Yeah, here, see if you can see that in there. When these lamp, they glow beautifully down the middle there. They have great ventilation. They've got large boxy plates. And you're going to see that, even though this is a miniature nine pin tube, you'll see that on all of these current pushers. You can, once you know what to look for, you'll recognize that a tube is designed to push current. Mm -hmm. So this is the smallest of them, but it can still push a hefty amount of current. And next one up, we have the 6080 and the 6AS7. And these are essentially both the same tube. Um, there were, the 6080 is technically, I believe, called the industrial version, and they built them in this uh, format, whereas the earlier 6AS7s were built in a Coke bottle or a straight bottle format with a different base on them. Yeah, I technically they call the Coke bottles ST. Mm -hmm. uh, but other than the, um, uh, the later version 6080s that I believe are the 6080... Um, uh, they go WCs. Yeah, there, WA, there's, BC. There's a lot of iterations over the years. Mm -hmm. um, and the, we've actually been quite lucky in that we've been we've got a good inventory of really high quality 6080s and 6AS7s. Yeah, yeah. And, and technically they have essentially the same specs as the original 6AS7s, although the later versions probably are able to handle a bit higher current. And so these are uh, amazing current pushers and they're amazing gr uh, current pushers in OTL tubes because they were designed to work as a power supply regulator. So if you have, say, a high voltage power supply for a piece of equipment and it's going to draw a lot of current, if you don't have it regulated, the voltage is going to sag whenever you draw that current. Let's say you don't want the voltage to sag. You would have a tube like this in here feeding as much current as possible to keep that uh, circuit running. So in old regulated power supplies, you'll often find these tubes. You'll find them in circuits where you can't have any voltage sag in the power supply line. But that also makes them excellent tubes for use as an OTL because they're very low impedance. And that explains why an awful lot of them are mil-spec yep. and were used by militaries because they had equipment that was very sensitive that, that needed good, stable power supplies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so these were sort of the classic power supply regulator tube. This is an absolutely beautiful... I'll back it up there and show the opening of the plate. Yeah, th this is a beautiful Svetlana made example. So this is a Soviet produced version. Uh, it's kind of hard to see that on camera there. Yeah. But these plates have these huge fins on them for dissipating heat. And 
This is just another great example of a 6AS7, and these, I believe, have an impedance of around 280 or 240 ohms, somewhere around there. This is actually higher impedance, around 1.6 or 1.8K, but it has a higher amplification factor, which makes a big difference for it. And this over here is probably the largest current pusher that we have in stock. We only have a few of these, but they are absolutely amazing tubes. And this is a 6336. And what this is, is essentially two 6080s or 6AS7s in one bottle. So this can push an absolutely ridiculous amount of current. And look at those plates. And look at the ceramic uh, spacers. Whenever you see um, plates built out of something that looks like volcanic rock, it probably is. Mm -hmm. And with ceramic spacers, that gives you an idea of the kind of power that the tube's designed to handle. And of course, you can pull the data sheet up at any time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this was built for the exact same reason as these guys, but it was built so that you could have one tube doing the job of maybe two or even three of these. And uh, the Soviet version of this is actually quite famous. Some people call it the demon tube or the devil tube because it has these three big prongs coming off the top of it. Is it three or two? I thought both plates came off the top. of. Oh, no, it doesn't have the plates. It's just a glass nub that comes off the top. And they were actually used in, I believe, Soviet big fighter jets as part of the, um, the voltage regulation in their radar system, I believe. Yeah. And they are another excellent OTL tube because of all the same reasons that these ones are. Yeah. In fact, I, I follow a gentleman um, online who, um, who designs uh, interesting um, uh, uh, audio gear the way we do. And um, he uh, actually was on a crew that um, was dismantling MIGs. Um, and um, and they were uh, scavenging tubes, and that was one of the tubes that he was able to scavenge out of it. <laughs> so, I guess when they salvaged the the components out of the out of those expensive fighter jets, they um, can you imagine the the all the control systems in the in the fighter jet were running on vacuum tubes, pretty much. <laughs> how many tubes were in there, and how hot? The, the, the cockpit must have gotten. Oh, I never thought of that. I mean, these just on their own, just one of these gets so toasty. It, it hits over 100 degrees Celsius. Yeah. <laughs> just one of them. <laughs> Imagine having, you know, 50, 100 tubes in something. Yeah, and that's where the problem starts. So you might think, well, if you need to get impedance down to four or eight, let's say eight ohms for um, a typical higher impedance uh, home speaker, you could just keep on paralleling tubes, right? And then eventually you'd be down to 8 ohms. And that's exactly how it's done. But the problem is... You need a lot of tubes. And, well, let's say you can find the tubes. We've got a lot of tubes. Yeah, well, they need a lot of heater current. And they need a lot of heater current, and that means you're going to have a lot of heat. Yep. And that is the problem. There, there are a couple of monoblocks out there that work with, you know, 8 or 16 of these tubes in parallel or something like 16 or 32 of these tubes in parallel. And, you know, I, I'm sure it's fine if you run it over the winter, but I would not want to run, run well, one of those in the summer. <laughs> if, you, if you're in a temperate climate like we are, you would run it in the winter with the air conditioning on. Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only way. Or wait until a really cold day. So there's... What I'm trying to say is that it's probably very practical to c come down to parallel and find tubes that will run, let's say, a 150 ohm headphone or a 300 ohm impedance headphone. It's not that practical to... Uh, to do 8, eight ohm speakers. Yeah. It can be done. Of course it can be done. And it, it has, has been, been done. done. But it's, it's not the easiest thing to do. And there's there's really not been a lot of of uh, commercial products and those that have come onto the market don't really last that long because the the practical nature of it is eh, you know mm -hmm. it's, it's just not there it's just horribly inefficient <laughs> yeah basically <laughs> tubes are already fairly inefficient compared to solid state so uh making that worse is not good for the power bill well thanks for doing that charles and i think you've got a few interesting things that came in let's just clean the decks Okay, so we've gotten some more interesting tubes in to cap off the end of our summer sale. 
Uh, we just had the longest day of the year yesterday, I think it was. Yes. And uh, wow, enjoyed that sunshine. Now it's only downhill from here. <laughs> um, so our summer sale is running until Sunday. Yep. And uh, so you've got a few more days left to take take advantage of that discount. But my goodness, in the first weekend, we just we were just about bowled under. Yeah, yeah, we had a ton of orders in. You know, it's how these sales go. We always have a lot of orders at the start and a lot of orders at the end. So we're expecting to be busy this weekend. And uh, we've gotten in a few more interesting tubes. So we've got some more of your favorite Toshiba 6CG7s. These are used versions, but they are testing absolutely beautifully. Let me get those testing numbers on screen. So that's testing right at New Old's dock, actually just a little bit above it. And these are great tubes. I cleared a whole bunch of them and I don't think I found a single noisy one. And they just sound great. So of course this is a uh, 6SN7 equivalent in a nine pin bottle and you can run them as a 6SN7 with the correct nine pin to octal adapter that we also have in the store. In fact, we've become so impressed with the Toshiba uh, manufacturing quality and the sonics of the tubes that I think we've now, we're gonna rank them alongside of the other great manufacturers that we really get behind. Svetlana, the real yep. St. Petersburg Svetlana. Uh, Sylvania, been, Phillips. Phillips, uh, Mullard, um, and a few other tube manufacturers that consistently um, put out really high quality. There's some more Russian uh, Soviet era manufacturers. Mm -hmm. um, NEVZ. And uh, uh, Ulyanov, I believe, is one. U Uly Ulyanov, yeah, that yeah. makes the GU50 that we use. Mm -hmm. um, just really good, rock solid manufacturers. Uh, we just I don't think we've ever seen a Toshiba tube that we didn't like. No, and, and we're going to keep trying to source them and find them for you when we can. Um, they aren't something that's common to see over in North America unless they've been rebranded by somebody, but we have been finding them in small quantities. Yeah. And this is another example of one right in here. Right here. So we just had this on screen a few minutes ago. This is the 6080. And uh, these are just absolutely beautiful examples of the tube. They... I think I don't think we've lost a single one in testing. They all test consistent in tight sections on them. They all test right at New World Stock, right where they're supposed to be. And that's just a really good sign yeah, that like they were quality tubes. Consistent tubes with section matching is um, is really a solid indicator of, of high quality manufacturing with good quality control. Yep. So so these are excellent tubes for something like the Bottlehead Crack or the Woo Audio WA22. Um, you need a pair of them for that one, but for the Crack you'd only need one with match sections. And lastly here we've been able to find some more of these absolutely beautiful GE 6SN7s, new old stock, new in box, and just look at, let me see if I can get that label clearer there. It's that dark red GE label, and it is in pristine condition. It's always nice whenever we can find new old stock tubes with the original brand's label on it, in box, and testing right where it's supposed to as well. 103, 106, that's right above new old stock and tight matched. Quite a few manufacturers used red labels to indicate that the tubes were um, meant to go to uh, wholesalers and, and, and service shops and, and com things like that. commercial duty. Yeah. And the tubes themselves are basically identical, but th because they ran different warranty uh, programs, depending on whether you were coming off the street and buying in a drugstore, which was a real thing back then, um, I've done it myself with... with uh, with my dad and grandfather whenever we were keeping the TV or the console operating or trying to get it to operate. <laughs> um, so we would get a regular label and the regular label on the G tube was um, an off-white. Um, now I'm not 100% certain if GE did uh, the, the red orange yes. commercial labeling, but S Sylvania definitely did. Sylvania did and a lot of other manufacturers because what they did was they they would offer uh, commercially they would offer a tube replacement program, but they wouldn't offer cash back 
for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, in uh, fact, RCA actually had a, a more robust line of their standard tubes that they called the Red Label series. Yeah, and I think that lasts a lot longer. I think what they were doing uh, that was the 5691, and I think the 5692. Yeah, 5691, two and three, I believe, were each different versions of the tubes. And I think what they did with that, that was a fairly late introduction in the second tube era. I think what they were doing was picking up on the fact that people had by then figured out, ah, if it's got a reddish, orangish label, then that's a commercial duty tube. When in fact, of course, they were the same tubes, just with a different label. But yeah, although the RCAs were actually built differently. So we'll give them that. They were built more rugged. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So, so we've got these guys in the store. We have lots of other great tubes, including plenty of EL34s, like the RFTs that we have on sale on top of the summer sale until Sunday. And I'm just gonna clear the deck here. Yeah, and... Um, the interesting thing about every every um, sale, we only run two sales a year, and every uh, sale has its own kind of unique focus. And this year, people have been buying up uh, quads of EL34s because um, not a lot of suppliers have um, good quads of matched vintage EL34s. They're just, a lot of them, as I've talked about before in uh, previous episodes, are basically endangered and some of them have even gone extinct. So customers are buying backups for sets that they already own so that they'll have their favorite tubes going forward as long as possible. And that is a really smart thing to do. So um, we've got a few days left. You can use the summer 2020, got my big fat finger in the road, code to get 15% uh, off of the entire store. That excludes the kits and gift certificates, of course, but that's every tube that's in the store, including tubes that are already on sale. So the Charles was mentioning, we've got quads of new old stock um, RFT EO34s that are actually on sale. So you get, you get uh, I think you get roughly 5% and then another 15%. So you get 20% off of those. And a number of you have already taken advantage of that deal. <laughs> yeah, we sold a lot of RFTs. We had a lot in stock, which is why we put them on sale. And um, yeah, so if your order is $150 or more after discount, the shipping is on us, folks. Stay safe, everyone. This is Jim and Charles signing off. Cheers, everyone.